Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to the Zeta stage. Uh, I normally present this with a hand microphone. I'm not doing that right now. So as you can possibly guess, I'm also the speaker for this session. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, just a quick note before we start. One that I'm trying to say uh, more often is, you know, remember you've got your bingo cards, your treasure hunt, whatever you want to call it. Get that filled in by all of the sponsors. Give it into the desk. You can win some awesome noise cancelling headphones. And with that done, let's get on with it. So, sometime back in, it was either 2021 or 2020, time kind of went really weird the last few years for some reason. You forget when things happen. But um, I saw a tweet come across my timeline. And this tweet said that if you are blogging, and you're using somebody else's network in order to blog, then no matter how awesome that network is, I use Dev.2 and I love it, but you're using your time, your effort, your energy to build up that website rather than building up your own brand. I kind of thought, I've got a point there. So this was 10.30 at night, I was in bed, I was on my phone and I immediately grabbed my laptop and I brought myself a domain. Actually, I brought myself three domains because who ever stops at one? So I got stacyclouds.net.com and .dev. And then once I had these domains, I did absolutely nothing with it because I'm sure many of us know that buying domains and using domains are two completely different hobbies. Don't stand in front of the beamer when it turns on because wow. Now, the problem that I had is that I didn't just want to put up a WordPress site and put content on the web. It's awesome. If that's what you want to do, all the power to you. But I wanted to play with it. I wanted to use technology. I wanted to learn new things, stretch myself, see just exactly what I could do. So I wanted to build my own application because, again, developers, why buy when you can build? This is not a good thing to do. Please don't take that away from this. But it did mean that I was going to have to build myself um, a front end so that I could interact with my site. I was going to have to build an API to get and save information. And because these things are going to be running in different places, I'm going to have to deal with cores and get them running together and try and make it work as one application. And just all the other stuff that you have to do to join this together. Now, previously in Microsoft, because I use Azure, there was a really cool tool called Static Web App. And it was inside of the storage account. I believe it's still there. And you could upload um, static files and you could serve them to the net without actually having um, anything in front of it, no server. There was limitations. You had no API. You could use Azure functions, but then you had to join them all together. Uh, custom domains were a nightmare. Getting it on a CDN meant that you had to do that yourself. And it was just all effort that I just didn't want to play with. Then came along Azure Static Web Apps, which isn't confusing at all, having the same resource in two different places with almost the same name. And it was just a very simplified and cheap way to actually get that dynamic application into the cloud. When you deploy an Azure Static Web App, not only do you get that hosting for your static files, hence the name Static Web App, you also get Azure Functions in the back end so that you can get data and turn your static files into a dynamic application. Uh, and that's just done for you. There's an amount of glue in the middle of there, which means you don't have to worry about it. You can put custom domains in there, which again means you don't have to worry about it. Um, and as a hobby site, even when you set it up, you get a CI CD pipeline out of the box. It's just awesome for playing with. I, I really love them. So I started looking at that and I started looking at Blazor and putting the two together, I started to build my own site. Now, if you look at it right now, it is a complete work in progress. I suspect it's always going to be a complete work in progress, but it does mean that at least when I've got a couple of hours, I can just pull up my laptop, play with something, push it out to production, and 99% of the time, it just works. Using static web apps, Blazor Wasm application, and some Azure functions to tell the world who I am. So, hi. 
I'm Stacy Cashmore. I'm Tech Explorer DevOps at Omniplan, which is a financial software advice company based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, I've been developing software since about the middle of the 1990s, and for the last few years, I'm just super honored to be able to call myself a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies. So that's enough of the slides. What we're going to do now is actually build one of these apps and see what we need to do to get it into production and some of the ways that you can work with it. So I'm afraid I'm going to get rid of Kermit and go to Visual Studio instead. I don't know if I should apologize for that or not. So if it's on the right screen, we have an empty Visual Studio because we're going to start right from the very beginning. And we're going to create a new app which is going to contain a new project which is going to contain our app. So we're going to start with a Blazor WebAssembly application. And we're going to call that client because naming is hard. But there's a good reason for calling it client. We'll get to that later. The location should be correct for my GitHub repo. And then we're just going to give the solution a name of Blazor Talk Demo because this is really where naming is hard. Now, I know that .NET 7 came out yesterday, but my demo is in .NET 6. I apologize. I'm going to be rewriting it over winter to see what the difference is. One thing I can say, .NET 7, way faster for Blazor than .NET 6 is, uh, but it should be good enough for today. Um, I'm leaving everything as default, so we're not going to, uh, going to include authentication here. The main most important one is this option here, ASP.NET Core Hosted. I want those static files that I can just throw on that um, Azure Static Web App and serve to the world. So I do not want this to run inside of a ASP.NET um, Core thread. So let's scaffold this up and be nice to the little machine and hope it does it quickly. And then once we have our client, we need our API, of course. So we're going to add an API here as well, another new project, and that's going to be an Azure function. So if the client's called client, you can expect the name to be API. And again, using .NET 6 here, and we're just going to leave everything as default. Uh, I do love that these days you don't have to create an Azure function when you actually go through the scaffolding process because it means less to clean up. So let's create that one. And here's our basic application. Now, just because some things do really bug me, I am going to do a little bit of cleanup before we get into the code. So um, I want to get rid of the sample data that we have in here. And then I want to get rid of the counter page. I'm sorry for the people that like clicking the button. And the fetch data page for those who uh, don't want to know what the weather's going to be like. Wet, by the looks of it. I'm also going to get rid of this survey prompt that they include inside of the scaffolded application. And just do a little bit of cleanup here as well. So is that what I want to delete? It is. Come on, computer, do something. Thank you. I've got one of those wonderful keyboards that's um, capacitive function keys. When they work, they're fine. When they don't work, they're really annoying because there's no haptic feedback. You don't know if you pressed or not. Uh, the nav menu, we've removed two pages. So I want to remove the navigation links to those pages too. And I believe if I build this, I now have my base application cleaned of all of the examples that you get from Microsoft when you scaffold up a Blazor application. Now we can get onto the fun stuff of actually adding things. If GitHub decides to respond to what I want to do. Now, I said in my intro that I use Dev.2 for my blogging purposes. So what I want to do with this application today is basically take my list of blog posts and I want to display it on my website. So we're going to make a call to Dev.2. They have an awesome API. So Dev.2, and if we go to the API, it should be in my history. You can go to articles, give a username, Stacy underscore cash is my username, and you get a whole load of JSON back, my list of blog posts. So we can use this to start that journey of extracting the data. So we're going to do that inside of the API. Let's close all of these so it stays a bit neat. By the way, is the code readable at the back? I checked it earlier and it seemed OK for me, but I want to check with, yeah, awesome. Thank you. So first thing that we're going to do is make a model for that data that we're going to get back from dev.2. For that, we're going to make a models folder. 
And inside there, we're just going to put a blog post summary model. So make a new class. Hope that Visual Studio is not too slow. Here it is. Now, I have a confession. This is all live coding, but at the same point, you don't want to spend the next 35 minutes watching me do loads of typos. So I've got code snippets that I'm going to bring across, and I'm going to go through them with you. If you do want to see me do typos for the next 35 minutes, don't money, worry. I've got some terminal sessions, and I'm sure I'm going to uh, please you there, too. So that's not what I wanted to paste. OK, so here's my blog post summary. Now, I am cheating here because it's a demo. This is both the model that I'm going to send to my client and using the JSON property names. It's also getting the data from uh, those, that dev.toJSON. Please don't do this. This is a terrible idea. I, this is not how it's done in my site, but it works for demos. Once we have the data that we're going to be using, so the ID, the title, the description, very important, the URL that we can use to get access to the full blog post, we want an Azure function that's going to return that to us. So we're going to add a new Azure function. It's going to be called not using API models, because that would be a terrible name for uh, an Azure function. It's going to be called blog posts. We're going to have it as a HTTP trigger. I'm not worried about the, wow, well, that's an interesting screen. This is what happens when you've got a 4K screen and then you move it across to a full HD. I'm not going to be doing anything with the open API today, so I'm going to ignore that for now. We'll just add it in, and then we're going to delete the lot because I have my own function to bring over. So anybody who's used Azure Functions before, I'm sure you're going to recognize how this works. We have a HTTP get method Azure Function that's going to be reachable on the blog post URL, so API slash blog posts. And what it's going to do is just three steps. It's going to get a HTTP client. I could probably inject this, but I'm not right now. Uh, then it's going to go out to that API articles and get my list of blog posts back, which is hard-coded and should really be parameterized. And then it's going to deserialize that into a list of blog post summaries to throw back to the client. Now, this isn't important for the static web app, but if you are on Dev.2 and you want to try this, you need to add these two headers to your um, calls. They changed this middle of last year, I believe, and I never realized until somebody contacted me on Twitter and said, you do know that your website's been down for two days, like, and I was like, no, really, right? Always fun when these things happen in production. So that's our API. This is all that we need to do to get the data from the outside, and we're going to return it to the front end. So make sure I've done everything right here. Quick build. And now we can move on to actually displaying this to our users in our client. So for that one, first thing that we're going to need is another model, because we need to read that data back again, of course. Come on, GitHub. You can do this. I think GitHub knows when I'm giving a demo because it always goes slow. Now, again, this is a bit of a cheat. My model in my actual application is actually shared between the front and the back end because it's all in one solution. Uh, but that takes longer um, to do. So for the purposes of demonstration, I am just cheating and adding the model in both sides. So, but because this one isn't talking to Dev.2, it's a much simplified model. It's just the data that we get from the front end, uh, from the API. Next up, in order to communicate with that API in the back end, because I'm using a Blazor application here, I'm going to make a service that handles that communication and caches the data so that we're not doing too many calls to the back end. Because even though it's a personal site, I still want it to be a little bit snappy when people are using it. So I'm going to add a Blazor service. And I'm going to stick that in its own folder as well. And we're going to add blog post summary service because it kind of does what it says. And this is a really short service. We inject a HTTP client because we get that out of the box with a Blazor Wasm application. We have a list of blog post summaries that um, consumers of this service can read. And we have this one task, load summaries, so that somebody can say to the service, hey, get the summaries for me. And it's going to say, OK, do I have summaries? If I don't, then I'll get them. 
And if I do have summaries, I'm going to do nothing just to make sure that we have that snappiness. Way better ways of doing this, but this works. Last but not least for the service, we need to make it available to the components that are going to be using it. So we're just going to add it to our dependency injection container in our program CS. And then we can actually put stuff on the screen, which is you know, kind of the idea of what we're doing. So I'm going to make a new page. So we're going to come to this pages folder, and we are going to add a new Razor component. We're going to call it blog posts. And again, we're going to bring some code over. So at the top of our uh, component, we have this app page directive. This app page directive, it turns it from a Razor component into a Blazor page. Saying goes, all Blazor pages are components, not all components are Blazor pages. We are injecting that blog post summary service. And then we're just getting those uh, summaries from that service. If they're null, we assume we've not loaded any yet, so we're just going to throw up a loading sign. If we do have a list of summaries, we're going to throw them on the screen. And last but not least, when this component is initialized, we're going to call that load summaries task uh, function so that we can actually set off the process of getting those summaries from the API. And last but not least, before we actually get into actually making that Azure static web app, we're going to change our navigation. We took out the links to the previous pages, but we just added a new one. So you could just type my website slash blog post, but I don't want to make things easy for users. So we're just adding another navigation link back into the website. One list check that it builds. And now we can push this up to GitHub and get on with the really fun stuff. No, we can't because that's way too many files. I've missed a step. I learned this a few weeks ago. If you take nothing else away from this talk, take this away if you use .NET. It used to be that making your git ignore was searching the web, finding a git ignore, copying it if it wasn't already included in your repo, and then manually adding it and everything else. You can actually do this from the .NET command line now. So if we do .NET init, can I remember the syntax, git ignore? So it's not init, it's new. We now have a new .NET git ignore file straight from the command line. I truly love this feature. And hopefully, if I refresh this now, it should, yeah, it was 800, it's now 38 files, so we're ready to go. Says she, hopefully, come on. Don't click the run button when you're giving a demo. It makes it really interesting. Thank you. So we've added our app. Add app. We're going to push this up to GitHub. And then we're going to get on with making that static web app itself. So just chat that that pushes out. Yeah, you've started, but I want to know that you've finished. Thank you. So here is my repo, which at the moment just has that readme file. If I refresh this now, we have our API, our client, and our solution. To get that up to the net, we need to come into the Azure portal. I've already made a resource group for this talk. And as you can see yesterday, I did a run through just in case anything goes wrong today. I've got something to fall back to, always useful. But we're going to try creating a new one anyway. So we're going to create a new static web app. Told you, typos. This is why I have code snippets. And we're just going to create this. First thing that we need to do is check the subscription and the resource group are correct. This should always be filled incorrectly if you're doing it from a resource group. But occasionally, there are bugs in the Azure portal. I know that the storage accounts had it last year. It didn't pre-fill the resource group. And if you didn't notice, it would just create you a new resource group for every storage account that you created in the portal and was interesting. Then we need to give a name. Anybody who's used Azure in the past, you know that for your app services, for your Azure functions, for your storage accounts, it has to be a unique name across the whole of Azure, which leads to some really interesting naming conventions to try and make sure this happens. Don't have that with Azure Static Web Apps. I can use A, and that is a perfectly valid name. It only has to be unique inside of the resource group that I'm using. The URL is generated by Azure for us, so that's not affected by this at all. 
So if we say build stuff demo, let's get rid of the cat blocks. Build stuff demo. Then we need to pick the hosting plan. We have two options here. We've got the free plan, as it says, good for hobby or personal projects or whatever. And you have a standard plan, which is good for general purpose production apps. You do have to pay for the standard app. You do get a few extra things, which you'll touch upon later on in the talk. It is ridiculously expensive. It's about seven euros 50 a month for this thing. So it's one of those Azure resources you've got to be careful about. Um, but for most things, certainly for any hobby personal projects, standard plan does so much, it's probably going to be good enough for you. I'm based in the Netherlands generally, so I'm going to choose a West Europe um, location to host it. And then we have our deployment details. Said in the beginning, when you have an Azure static web app, you deploy it, uh, or you create it, you get a pipeline out of the box for you that does your um, CI, CD, Anytime you make a change to a branch, it gets pushed to production for you. That works for GitHub. I believe now it also works for Azure, Static, um, Azure DevOps, which is why that's on this list too. But you don't have to use that pipeline. If you host your code somewhere else, if you want to make your own pipeline, you can do that just by clicking on the other button and uh, it sends you to a page giving you instructions on how to do that. I'm going to do it from GitHub. I need to pick my repo, which would be my Blazor Talk demo, and I need the build stuff demo branch. Next, our build presets. What are we trying to throw to production? Out of the box, Azure Static Web Apps will handle the build process for you for quite a lot of frameworks. So you see it here. Angular, Blazor, Next, Nuxt, Nuxt again, React, Svelte, Vue, we have static generators for Gatsby, Hugo, Viewpress, and then this other custom again. So again, if you're using a different language, you can put your own build steps in here to make sure that it works for what you need. We're building Blazor, so we're going to select that. Last three things that we need to do before we can actually click on that Create button, where does our code live? By default, it gives you client for client, API for API, which is why I use it in my code. You don't have to use those, but if you do something different, remember to change it here. And that output location. If you're building Blazor, ignore that output location. This just works out of the box. If you're building um, a JavaScript framework, this seriously matters and check the documentation to see what you need to put in here in order for it to find the code that you've built. Fun one. If I change from Blazor to Angular in the future, and I still store it in that client folder, the only thing I've got to change in my pipeline is that output location. Because the pipeline just picks up on what technology you're using, you don't actually need to change the pipeline itself. So we'll create this. This generally takes a couple of seconds to build, even when I'm doing demos, so I'm hoping that stays the same today. Um, they're one of the quicker Azure resources to actually get up and running which is why I don't mind doing it in a demo and not create this beforehand. Don't make a liar of me today. Thank you. So here is our app. And you can see I said we get a URL out of the box given to us. And we have Grey Cliff. They have all sorts of wonderful names. I've had Yellow Beach and Purple Sun. It, it's nice, pretty names. And then we have a link to where um, our code came from. We'll look at that one in a second. First of all, let's have a look at our app. Not quite what I was expecting, because this isn't my code, but your Azure Static Web App is live and waiting for your content. The Azure Static Web App itself is live, but the code still isn't there yet, because that takes just a little bit of time. And that comes from our GitHub action runs. If we go back to GitHub, if we go back to GitHub, thank you, we have an action that um, runs now. This is the workflow file that gets created when you first um, deploy an Azure Static Web App. And this does two things. So I do want to show you what is inside of this workflow file. First up, what branch is it running on? I put build stuff demo, so that's the one that's in here, obviously. And that works on push to build stuff demo. But we also have these pull requests. If you open, synchronize, reopen, or close a pull request, this workflow file will also get kicked off. And it does two things. If you're pushing to your main branch, or if you are doing anything except for closing 
a pull request. It will use this GitHub action, static web apps deploying, and using a token which is created in your repo uh, when you create the static web app, it will um, build your code, deploy your code, check your code is running in production, and then close it for you. If you are in a pull request, it does something really special. It creates you a new environment uh, automatically by itself. So you can test your features in production before you push it to production, again, out of the box without doing anything. And when you close a pull request, because you don't want to leave these staging environments up forever, for one thing, in the free version, you only get two of them. In the paid version, you get five. So it's going to clean it up for us at the end of that flow as well. Now, these workflows generally take about three minutes to um, run. So we're going to let that one carry on now, and we're going to go back to the code. Because there's a Dutch phrase, that additor under it has. The thing that you can't see here, the elephant in the room, when you deploy to Azure, you have that code in the middle, uh, that glue in the middle that connects your front end to your back end and makes it look like one coherent application. I don't have Azure running on my laptop. It's not a bad little machine, but it's not that powerful. So we need a way to actually run this locally as well so we can develop it. It used to be when Azure Static Web Apps were in preview that you had to do all sorts of stuff to your code to make this happen for you. But then last year, I think, they had a preview of the Azure Static Web App CLI, which went GA in May, I want to say, that solves this problem for us. So we're just going to set both of our projects to be startup, and then we're going to run it. And hopefully we are going to have an Azure function appear here. If Windows actually lets me drag things across the screens. And we have our website as well. So here we are running on 706. And if I go to the blog post, it goes boom because it can't find that API because it's looking on 7006 for the API instead of looking on 7193. So what we're going to do instead is try and get this down a bit. Go back to my previous terminal. Wow, well, that's really not readable, is it? Let's see if I can do this for you. And we're going to run static web app, the name of this CLI. And we're going to be using the start command. It does a lot more than just what I'm showing you here. You can initialize new static web apps. You can deploy them. You can log into the Azure portal with it. Um, really powerful little CLI tool. But we are just going to be looking at the start. And we want to run at not HTTPS, because my laptop really doesn't like that. We're going to be using HTTP version of our um, website, which is running at 5006, apparently. So what this will do is take any request that isn't coming into part of that glue in the Azure Static Web App, and it's just going to redirect it to localhost 5006 and serve it as normal. For the API, if you're running on 7071, which used to be the default furniture function using .NET and isn't anymore, you wouldn't need to do anything. This will just automatically connect to 7071, so your website will just work at this point. Unfortunately, we don't. We're using the new version of Visual Studio and .NET, and so we're running on 7193. To get around that, we can actually change the port that we use for our API by using this um, argument, API port. And my memory is awful. 7193. Is it 7193 or 7139? Thank you. That's my Dutch and English side of my brain fighting with each other because we switch, num switch numbers around all the time. So what this will do now is start up a Node.js server which likes to pretend that it is an Azure static web app. This warning that you see on the screen, really, really important because it doesn't match Azure completely. It is brilliant for developing, but before you go to production, you really want to see this working in Azure because there are just a couple of differences that can come back and bite you. 
Most important one is we get this localhost 4280. So we now have a new URL that we can use. And if I come back to my browser, we can go to localhost 4280. We can keep our fingers crossed. We can hope it loads reasonably quickly. That loaded too quickly. This is going to crash. Because I need to disable the cache and force it to reload. Isn't it great in computing that you can actually say, yeah, I know this isn't going to work because it was too quick? Hey, look at that. So we can now click on blog posts. We get that list of blog posts that I was showing you. And if we click on one, it opens up in a new screen. It's not much, but it is that first step that I was talking about of getting stuff out. And it's also, we now have something running in production in, what, a little under half an hour from beginning to end, cheating a little bit with code snippets. But it is that quick to get this thing up and running. Uh, are we running in production yet? Because that's local. I'm lying to you. I don't like liking, lying to you. I apologize. Yeah. Drum roll. Loading. Nearly. Loading. Loading. Yay! There we go. Now we are running in production. So, like I said, it's half an hour. We're up and running in production. And now every time we make a change, it's going to be pushed forward. Now, one change that I'm going to push forward is a slight problem with static web apps. This blog post page, it doesn't exist on the server. It only exists inside of that Blazor application, same as with any other single page uh, application. So when I hit F5, I get a 404 because it's going out to the static web app and saying, give me this page. And the static web app's going, oh, I've never seen that page. What we need to do is trick the static web app into doing this for us. So we're going to go back into the code. It's going to stop this running. And inside of the client and the www folder, we're going to make a new file. Now, again, this file, uh, that's what I wanted. It does an awful lot. And I am just showing you the tip of the iceberg uh, with it. And again, come on, GitHub. Where is it gone? That's always fun when your code snippets die on you. There we go. That's what I wanted. So there's a file called staticwebappconfig.json. And this is just, as the name suggests, a JSON file. And this allows you to control your static web app programmatically using configuration data. So what I want to bring in is one line. The very minimum that you should be adding to any Azure static web app, navigation fallback. So if I request a page and that page doesn't exist, unless it is an image, a CSS, or the other one that I always forget to add to my notes, inside of the API folder, what I want you to do instead is just deliver me the contents of that index.html and then let the browser deal with it. That knows the routing. That can then rebuild my application for me and users can see what they need to see. This is one that you don't get to see running locally because of how um, .NET works. Even though I've said don't give me a um, .NET Core hosted server, it still gives you a .NET Core hosted server when you're debugging. So you never see that 404 error unless you publish static files and run those inside of your static web app. So let's add this. Add a nav fallback. That looks like I've got all of the curly braces correct. We'll push that up. Uh, yeah, save it, because if we don't save it, that's not going to do us a lot of good. And then we have 10 minutes left to show you really one of the cool tricks about Azure Static Web Apps. Do we have a new action fired off? Seriously, GitHub's having issues. 
I know what I've done wrong. Sorry. This is complaining on a different screen. Because we added that workflow file, of course I can't push to GitHub. I've got to pull and then push. I apologize for that. Now it should push it. Thank you. And now we should hopefully get that um, new build going. Come on. I promise people this works. Here we go. So there's our CI CD flow in action. We push up to main. We get a new workflow. I've done nothing for this. For a hobby site, it's awesome. You can override it. So this isn't just a toy. Uh, this is just the basics of getting it started. The cool trick that I was talking about that I want to show you before um, we end. Authentication. I've not got time to do the code in a 45 minute session, but I think it's a really important one to show for a static web app in general. I said I want to write my own blog posts, which at some point means I'm going to put an edit screen on this, which means I want to know that I'm writing it because I'm sure you're all awesome, lovely people, but don't take this the wrong way. I don't want you writing my blog posts. So I need to know who's using my site. I am not an authentication expert. We have one of those in the office. He's fantastic. I'm really happy he's there. And in a static web app, thankfully, I don't need to be. One of the glue directories that we have is called .auth. And if we go to .auth slash me, we get this JSON back. Client principle, which at the moment is null because I'm not logged in. If I want to log in, I can go to login slash Twitter because I am still using it. I get redirected to Twitter. I get authenticated. I've never used this static web app before, so I have to grant consent to it. And now I'm logged in. You can't see that I'm logged in because I don't have any code for it. But if I go back to that dot auth slash me endpoint, I now have a whole load of data available. I have an identity provider, Twitter, because I use Twitter. I could have used Google, I could have used GitHub, or I could have used AAD for Azure Active Directory. I get a user ID. This user ID is unique to that Twitter handle on this specific static web app. So if I was to log into a different static web app, I would have a different user ID. You cannot use this to compare people across static web apps. You can use the user details. And that is my Twitter handle, Stacy underscore cash. If I'd logged in with GitHub, it would be my GitHub handle, Stacy cash. If I'd logged in with AAD or with Google, then instead I would have got my email address for that particular user. This is an important one to keep in mind because you might think, well, the user detail just gives me a handle. I can treat it as such. It doesn't. It just gives you whatever that particular authentication provider returns for you. Uh, we don't have custom authentication set up for this web app, but then it gets really important because for custom authentication, you get a whole host of information back in this, which you don't necessarily want to be putting on screen all the time. Finally, we have user roles. Every single person that logs into my application will get anonymous and authenticated. I don't know why they send anonymous because it's one that you ignore most of the time, but there it is. We can add different uh, roles to users. And looking at the time, I can probably show you that one. As you may have seen on the opening slide, this is supposed to be a 60 minute talk. So I'm trying to figure out which parts I can show you and which parts are like super important to know. So if we come into our new build stuff demo static web app, we have this role management. Here I can invite new users into my application. And as I say, you can use Active Directory, GitHub, Twitter, Google is in preview, Facebook says that it's in preview, but I don't know if it has to be a private preview that I'm not involved in. I have never got this to work. So try it, see what happens. Tweet at me if you get it working and tell me what I'm doing wrong, please. We're gonna use GitHub because we're gonna use my Stacy Cash GitHub account. And I'm gonna give myself, I don't know, this super user role inside of my application. I'm going to generate a link. We'll copy this. I'm going to log out of my Twitter account. And then we're going to log in with that link that we've just sent. This is now going to um, check me against GitHub. 
which of course is being slow today, so thank you very much, GitHub. We need to consent again because I've never used this app before with this account. And now when we log in and we come back to that auth slash me endpoint, I now have this super user role. So that's how we can add people to and from our application. You can do all of this using the command line as well, so you're not limited to just doing this inside of the portal. Um, some important things to know about this. Inside of this one management screen, you can only have 25 users, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's only for those users that need special roles. If you just want to know if they're authenticated, there's no limit. If you do need more than 25, you can go to a standard tier static web app, and then inside of this screen, you can do 25 users, which sounds remarkably similar, and I don't know why. But what you can do instead is also use your own role provider. Completely ignore this screen. You make a uh, Azure function which will deal with your roles for you. You can use your own identity server. You can check against whatever you need to do and you handle all of your roles there and then you have an unlimited amount of roles because you're in charge of it. But out of the box for the role management, 25 users with special um, roles. Important thing to remember. Right, are we deployed yet? We are deployed, so now we should, if I've done everything correctly, be able to go to our blog posts endpoint and it now loads. So that navigation fallback solves this problem for us, so always include that if you're creating a static web app, uh, otherwise you pull your hair out for a few minutes when you try and figure out why people can't bookmark things and it all goes horribly, horribly wrong. Four minutes, right. Last thing then is, if I can get this right, which one do I need to open here? Custom domains. I'm talking about building my own brand and I have Greycliff ob464f803.2.azurestaticwebapps.net, which doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Adding a custom um, domain to our application is reasonably simple to do. I'm not going to go through the full process because you have to set it up inside of your DNS provider. That can take anywhere between about two minutes and two days, and you never know which one it's going to be. Um, so, and every DNS provider is different, so we're not going to be setting this up, but I do want to show you the steps. In the port, we can come to the custom domains, we can add a new one, and we have two options. If you manage your domain using Azure, then it's really super simple because you just put in your domain name and it takes care of everything for you and it just works, it's awesome. If you host your domain name outside of Azure, which I do, then you come through this different flow, adding a custom domain. You add your website here. And then you have to add a C name to your DNS with basically the URL of um, your static web app that you're trying to connect to. You can have in the standard tier two custom domains, which is really important because not only do you really need www, you also need the um, root of just um, Stacy Clouds. So you've got to register two different custom domains to work this. On the standard tier, you can put five custom domains on should you need it. And I believe that is pretty much everything I wanted to show you and I appreciate I'm holding you back from lunch and I don't want to do that. So let's get back to our presentation. Okay, it's now finished. There we go. It's 42 minutes-ish, so it, it has been a really whirlwind tour, but we've created the website, we've fetched the data, we've deployed it, we've seen the CI CD working, we still need to make it look pretty. Um, I'm no CSS expert, so if you look on my website, you'll see it's still not that pretty. Uh, and we need to add that extra content of actually being able to do our own blog post and getting more onto our site. Obviously, a blog post is not necessarily a good candidate for this, but it works quite nice for a demo, but you can build a lot of things using this. We use it in the office for our admin portals. All of those are built using Azure Static Web Apps. Um, nice and easy to deploy. On the standard tier, you can integrate it inside of your enterprise domain quite um, nicely as well. 
If you want to learn more, this URL will take you to MS Learn. If you don't want to learn more about um, Azure Static Web Apps, still seriously follow this because MS Learn has some seriously amazing resources for developers. And for pure shameless self-promotion, I wrote a book about this which was released a couple of weeks ago. That QR code will take you to my publisher and that discount code, I'm assuming, will give you 20% off uh, should you want to use it. I've been Stacey Cashmore. I want to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I'm out of time for questions, but I'm around, so please come and ask me. And I have shiny stickers at the front for anybody that wants to make their laptop go bling. Thank you very much.